Okay, I believe we are live. So Perfect. anyone who's watching this now, if you were part of the live stream that we tried to do in the Facebook group, I do apologize again. Uh, we wasted a lot of your time with some technical issues. Uh, Thomas is very graceful to still uh, talk to me today after all the, the hassles and time wastage. And okay. uh, we're going to try and get into this as quickly as possible. Um, our brief introduction, I met Thomas through functional patterns. Uh, he came into uh, the field to explain a bit more of Jack Cruz's stuff to us in one of the courses I was in in Netherlands last year. And he had such a big impact on me and explained things to me so well and uh, gave me so much value that uh, I really i have been so excited to have him in this group one day. And he's decided to, to talk to us today, which I'm really excited about. So Thomas, would you mind briefly just telling us a little bit about yourself and how you became a mitochondrial expert? Yeah, of course. No problem. Thanks for the invite. Um, so yeah, um, from when I was 12 until 22, I was uh, playing tennis on a, uh, on a national level. And I was always really interested in how can I do better? How can I perform better? So I was always looking into uh, diet and nutrition um, books, articles, studies, uh, you name it. And um, after a search on YouTube, I, uh, I found Paul Check. So I started reading all his stuff, his book, uh, Eat, Move and Be Healthy, a couple courses. And I also did a couple courses in the Netherlands, get some um, orthomolecular degree. So you can be a consultant that you know that you're on biochemical level, you know what food is doing and how you can help people with supplements and food and a, 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 yeah, a certain type of lifestyle. And I, I still was missing a lot. Um, some of my uh, sisters had a, had a small problem as well. So I was looking into it more and more. And then one day I found, uh, 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 I was looking on a video on Chuck Fresco talking about health as well. He's a big inspiration for me as well when it comes to uh, all the health stuff. And uh, I saw a video of a guy named Jack Cruz that was like five, six years ago. And from there on, uh, I, I started reading all Jack his stuff. And in the beginning, it was quite hard, but yeah, I was so motivated and yeah, it really clicked with me that there's more than uh, nutrition and exercise when it comes to health. And yeah, just start reading all his stuff, become a member, talk to him on occasion. Um, yeah, just read all the books he recommended when it comes to light, water, magnetism, Gerald Pollack, Alexander Warren, uh, uh, Robert O. Becker. There's so much to read and I tried to read it all. It was almost like... Uh, I was obsessed with it. I was reading like every day, sometimes 10 hours in a row. And uh, yeah, from there on, uh, doing some more courses, getting my uh, basic medical degree here in Holland. And yeah, from there on, just building and then, on. And then recently you started up your health concept. Uh, that's your, your own company. And uh, what, yeah. do you, what do you guys do? Yeah, so uh, we're c consulting people uh, with health problems and we're trying to teach them um, what is needed for their uh, specific context. So um, that's one of the big reasons we call it your health concept. It's your health. We can put up a concept. We don't know 100% sure that it's gonna work out, but we're gonna try it, we're gonna test it. And if it's not gonna work out, we're gonna do it again. So we teach people about the mitochondria, about light, about water, that there's more than diet and exercise to the story. Basically, teach people to get their circadian rhythm back in order, uh, if that's even possible with their, with their daytime job or with their nighttime job, and teach them you're a product of nature and you're living a not natural life, indoors all the time, fake food, uh, polluted water, uh, fake lights. So just try to um, teach people to trust their feeling a little bit more and common sense is in the picture also. Uh, you're a product of nature and you're not living um, a, a life in nature. How do you think that's going to work out if we do that with plants or with uh, other type of animals? No sunlight, no natural. No, no, that's not going to work out and that's not good for the plant. Okay, but you're basically a plant as well. <laughs> you need that light as well. You need an environment also. And from there on, we try to help people. So a little bit of education and we have some protocols. Um, yeah, where we can help people. Yeah, I think that's one of the, you know, everyone thinks that sunlight's bad for you and it's, it's one of the things that's causing modern diseases, things like cancer and that. 
And to me, it never made sense. I mean, we've, we've, we evolved under the sun and we've lived under yeah. it for such a long time, yet we blame it for modern diseases and people don't seem to put together the, the picture that we don't, we don't get into natural light as much as we used to anymore. And we're under a lot more artificial light. And that's obviously, you know, what you and I are discussing now on the first pillar of, you know, optimal circadian, uh, or optimal circadian and mitochondrial health is your light environment. Uh, what would you say is, is like, what, how are we um, deviating from nature with modern technology? Uh, yeah, before I'm going to answer that, um, it's understandable uh, because a lot of information that's out there is missing the context. So, for example, um, uh, sunlight, especially UVB light, it can cause cancer in a certain context. And in that context, we see if you investigate it a little bit more that people are uh, missing uh, sunlight from the morning and uh, uh, sunset and that they are on the beach all the time between 11 and 4 and that they eat uh, garbage foods. They don't drink good quality water. They don't exercise. Um, so the context is missing like, oh yeah, from sunlight you get cancer. Um, from sunlight you also get vitamin D and that's uh, helping preventing cancer. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I get it that w that people read stuff and they they get all messed up. Like, what do I have to believe? And um, that's what I learned from Fresco, uh, like 10, 12 years ago. You have to do your own investigation and you have to learn how to evaluate what is true or what is not true, or which methods are trustworthy or not. So, um, um, I get the confusion, but there's way more to it. And you have to investigate um, those those articles and you have to be willing to put time and effort in your own health. Now, these days, yeah, we're living in a, in a modern world where, where it's pretty hard to be healthy or optimal because of all the uh, yeah, not natural stuff that's in there. Sorry, I lost the question. <laughs> uh, well, it's to, to do with light and, and uh, how we're uh, you know deviating from nature. Uh, what are the you know what are the, the things that we're doing now that are unnatural with modern technology and how you know that's changing our lighting environment? Things like artificial light, like how are those impacting us? Yeah, so yeah, uh, some people heard of uh, of the circadian rhythm, I guess, and. Um, yeah, that's a cycle um, that's controlled by light, but it's con it's not controlled by one frequency or one time of the day. It needs all the frequencies of the sun. I always give the example that everybody knows that when the sun comes up, it's different uh, when the sun goes down. We all know a really nice red sunset. We're enjoying that in the beach. But in between that, there's a lot of stuff happening. Uh, for example, now here in Holland um, in autumn, there's no UVB light, so I can make vitamin D. So the sun is not just one frequency or one thing, and it, it is there and it doesn't matter. No, it does a lot in everything on earth, but also in us. So living on the one frequency or one type of light, um, like indoor light, um, is not the same as the sun. So a lot of uh, human processes that are needed to be optimal are controlled by light, but we're missing that light. And the, the, the frequency we are missing the most is the red light, and um, so the normal red light, but also the infrared light part of the spectrum. What would you say to most, you know, a lot of people have the excuse, they say when, you know, when they go out in the sun, they burn. And I know Jack Cruz sp speaks about building up your solar callus. I mean, I've got a, I'm quite a um, pale skin type, and I used to be one of those people who burnt a lot. And I've definitely found yeah. that as I get, I, because I've gotten more morning light exposure and evening light as well, uh, watching the sunrise and the sunset, I find that I can get, I, my tolerance, I don't burn anymore when I go out in the sun, even if it is kind of midday and I, and I get hit by some harsh sun. So what are the mechanisms? So, I mean, how does that, that go about? Yeah, that's exactly an example of how all uh, frequencies of the sun are important uh, to be healthy. So when the sun comes up, there's not a, a lot of UV light. So the red part of the spectrum and the blue light of the spectrum, the visible part of the spectrum and the infrared light that's always present in sunlight, 42% uh, if you're in Alaska on a winter day or in, uh, in Africa on a summer day, there's always 42% infrared A light. That light preconditions the skin 
a certain type of proteins and warn the body like, oh, watch out. Later on during the day, there's going to be a bigger stressor from the UV light. So the skin is going to protect itself against the UV, uh, UV light. So if you're missing that morning signal that uh, later on the day, there's going to be UV, UVB especially, but in general UV, UV light, then the skin is not prepared. So you're playing uh, a tennis match without a warm-up, uh, without a, a preseason, and you have to walk into a Wimbledon final, and 10 minutes ago you didn't know what's up. And you're going to be less prepared and you're going to the chance of you getting injured is bigger than when your mind is set and your body is set and you're focused on it and light is doing that job for you when it comes to your skin and when it comes to your cells when it comes to your eyes the rhythm the function of the hormones everything is controlled by that morning light when it comes to this situation so morning lights kind of like your solar foreplay if you want to be playing out later in the day and in, in the midday sun, you've got to warm yourself up in the, in the morning first. Exactly. And that has to build as well. So let's say, for example, it's your first morning light. Let's, let's say that's the situation. And you're going to be in that morning light for 15, 20 minutes. The context depends as well. Are you going to be in the morning light in the winter, in the summer, in Holland, in Africa, um, what 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 is your health in general looking like uh what's your genotype um uh, it, skin color um stuff like that all dependent so if you're going to be in the morning light for 20 minutes and then going to be in the sun uh, in the african sun for six hours and you're white with a white skin yeah of course the chance you're getting burned mm. is still pretty big you have to build it up and that's why jack calls it the solar callus you have to build it up mm. and you need morning light to build it up. Does it matter what part of the world you're in? Because now I, if I'm traveling, let's say for instance, I've built up my solar callus here in Cape Town, South Africa. And I say, let I, let's say I travel to Hawaii and I get a different kind of uh, sun. Do I need to be wary then? Do I need to almost rebuild that callus and because it's a new kind of frequency or new latitude? Uh, yes and no. Um, yeah, you're, you're close to the equator then, for example, me. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, for me, it's going to take a lot more time when I travel to Hawaii. And for you, because you're already used to stronger UV light, um, it's going to take you less time to do that. Okay. And it depends also on how much are you in the sun. I'm, I, I try to work outdoors as much as I can. I do morning light for an hour uh, and then I, I never work, uh, work out inside the gym. So I'm outside quite a lot so I, I don't get burned easy mm. uh, but now winter is coming and if I if I fly to Hawaii in let's say uh, February yeah then I'm I'm gonna make sure that I am in the morning light and in the evening light most of the time and not that much in the middle of the day when the UVB is really strong but you won't be laying yourself up with sunscreen or anything like that huh? no I never use sunscreen no 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 <laughs> um, that's just let's just leave to chemical garbage yes <laughs> <I> mean, yes <laughs> it, it's an indicator if you if you need that stuff that you're not healthy because your body is not able to digest the sunlight that is coming in mm -hmm. and then so the next the next pillar we're going to jump into which is water and i i mean i know they're closely related it's almost an, an injustice to separate them um i wanted to discuss with you the easy zone and why that's important and how light comes into that yeah, so for people who don't know, the exclusion zone is the, is, is, um, is the exclusion of electrons and protons in water, and it happens by light. Uh, it can happen by a couple frequencies, but it, it, the, the most attention goes to the uh, red part of the spectrum that builds the exclusion zone. And uh, to know why that is important, we have to make a sidestep to the mitochondria. Uh, in the mitochondria, you've got a couple ways of producing energy, but the most efficient way of producing energy in the mitochondria, and the mitochondria is the, uh, the, the, the energy factory in our cells. We've got a lot of them. It uh, depends on what type of cell it is. But they produce, the mitochondria produces ATP and water. 
cellular water. So it's completely different water than you get out of your tap or buy in a bottle. It's different water. They also call it metabolic water. It has all types of names, but it's different water. And in that process to make that ATP and water, the mitochondria uh, has to use the electron chain transport at least if it, wa if it wants to produce uh, energy efficiently. And in that electron chain transport, the name already says that, is that you need electrons, but you also need protons. And protons is water. H plus is a proton. And that's where water comes into place because when there's going to be uh, infrared light on water, so on you, on me, on, on water in a certain type of bottles or in a lake, um, the, the red light creates an exclusion zone and excludes electrons from protons. And that's what an exclusion zone does. And that means that it, the body is able to produce um, more energy, but also way more efficient energy because the hard labor to exclude those electrons and protons is already done by light. Mm. So we had, a, we had a question in the group quite recently in our circadian warriors group. And uh, I just asked people if they did anything to, uh, to deplete their deuterium levels. And uh, there were three, three answers. It was one, yes, two, no. And the third one was, what is deuterium? And we actually yeah. had more than half of the people said, what is deuterium? So yeah. while, we're, while we're busy talking about water quality and the exclusion zone, would you mind um, telling us why deuterium is an important factor and why you would want to be looking for a high quality water source for that? Yeah, okay, so deuterium has uh, a couple jobs in the body, but if you focus on, on, um, on the mitochondrial part and uh, producing energy, uh, deuterium is a heavier isotope of water. So H plus is an isotope of water and deuterium is heavier. And in the mitochondria, um, there, there's a nanomotor, the ATPase synthase, so uh, the fifth cytochrome, and that's where... Uh, Protons go in, then it's going to spin really fast and it produces ATP. So the heavier the water that is going into that machine, into that energy production machine is, the less energy it's able to produce. So you don't want heavy water in that machine because the machine is going to run slower and we need it to run fast. To produce a certain amount of energy to be to become optimal or to be optimal so deuterium is also seasonal and it's also linked with light and you want to deplete yourself from deuterium when there's not a lot of food around because you want efficient energy because your backup system food is not around so in the winter we're going to deplete the deuterium that we build in the summer it's like day night yin yang just just give it a name uh, some some people uh, found yin yang a little bit woohoo but actually <laughs> I, it, it's it's a pretty smart uh, yeah. pretty smart symbol and a pretty smart philosophy but um so uh, plant foods have uh, way more deuterium in them and they grow in long light cycles so you eat them in the summer and that's okay because you can produce the lack of energy that's caused by the deuterium. You can produce that by sunlight, by the amount of sunlight that's there. But in the winter, there's not a lot of food. Yeah, that's normal because there's not a lot of light. So that backup system, we cannot use that much. There's not a lot of light, so we cannot produce energy directly. So we need to get rid of the deuterium so that we make sure that the water that's in the body it's h plus so i can produce more energy so i can survive the circumstances that there uh, are there at that time so in holland in the winter 500 years ago there was no grocery market you cannot walk to the refrigerator three times a day so the body has to have backup system and that to protect itself against the cold against the lack of food and against the lack of energy from the sun and deuterium plays a role in that system. So do you have to worry about deuterium uh, a lot in the summer? No, not that much. Depends on your context again. If you're living outdoor, outdoors, don't worry about it. If you're living indoors a lot of time, then I would recommend don't eat food 
with a lot of deuterium in it. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, and in the winter, start depleting it. How can I deplete my deuterium? Fasting is one way. Being in ketosis is one way. Maybe you can change your water because normally uh, the environment does that when it comes to deuterium and water. But now, yeah, we don't drink water out, out of nature anymore or at least not directly. We, we, we buy it in bottles, in plastic bottles, and that's also not so healthy. And um, heating up water um, causes the deuterium content to rise and the colder the water is or uh, from the colder areas it's coming from. So uh, for us, that's uh, Northern Europe, the less deuterium content is in the water. So if you want to lower down your deuterium level to produce more energy, you can buy um, yeah, certain types of water that are lower in deuterium. Perfenta is a, is a brand that focuses in on low deuterium water or deuterium depleted water. But on the other hand, um, yeah, it's there and it has its role. But if you are living seasonally and you eat seasonally and you are in the sun a lot, then you don't have to worry that much about deuterium, except when you're having an autoimmune disease or certain types of cancer. I, I understand that um, you know, like the mitochondria and the chlorophyll in plants are very similar, and I know the mitochondria repels deuterium as much as it can, and it's the same in plants. So your green leafy vegetables. I believe those are the lowest in deuterium and they actually push the deuterium to the fruit. And that would make sense because as you say, you know, in summer, it's not a problem to have a bit more deuterium. That is where you're going to be building it up. And that is the time of the year when you would eat fruit. And Jack Cruz yeah. always says, you know, you shouldn't be eating a banana around Christmas when it's out of season in his, his place. I can, yeah, eat, that's... I can eat bananas in Christmas. I'm allowed. It's, it's summer yeah. for us then. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That just shows how the seasonal eating comes into it and with deuterium. Yeah, and I think that's what a lot of people are missing. And uh, before I was trying to explain that it's normal that people are missing that stuff, but it's all seasonal, it's all connected. Mother nature is 3.8 billion years of evolution. She's pretty damn smart. And if a system is working, then she's going to keep it and she's going to use it. So, for example, uh, um, I learned that from Jack Cruz as well. The DHA has been around for almost 600 million years and it's never been replaced. So, uh, apparently, it's important because Mother Nature still uses it. The seasons are important because Mother Nature is still using it. The laws, the physical laws of nature are under the control or are uh yeah working together with mother nature and if you're gonna deviate yourself from those laws so light clean water uh magnetism not from phones and laptops and uh, all kinds of stuff then that's gonna affect your functioning because your functioning is based on those laws on those natural laws and your uh, cells are under those laws for 600 million years 3.8 billion years uh even so yeah um so that's the same with the deuterium as well everybody's focusing on deuterium now really really bad i always advise clients focus more on the light the seasoning being outside because then the deuterium story in you is going to get fixed because mother nature knows how to fix you and knows how to make you optimal mm. I, I think that's exactly, you're saying context. I think that's what a lot of people are missing. And I think it's because there's a lot of uh, figures in this industry who are, they're always in the extreme. And that's, that's part of being in the, in the limelight. There's always an extreme view on things. And I know, yeah. you know there's some people who are completely against DHA now. And they say you shouldn't be eating at any time of the year. It's toxic. And I know you, know, you can't actually speak about the different uh, levels of DHA in fish, whether they're closer to the equator or further away. And again, that it makes complete sense. So contextually, how would you say DHA plays a role? When is it, you know, when is it in context and when shouldn't you necessarily be having a lot of DHA? No, for example, if you, uh, we got two recycle systems it's called the Bazan effect. Uh, you got a short loop from the eye and you got a long loop through the liver and it recycles DHA. But blue light uh, breaks that recycle system. 
So if you're having a lot of blue light in your life because you're working at the office and you're not wearing a blue blocker, oh, I saw a question, uh, hey, why no blue blocker? I got a red light next to me and my computer screen is blocked with uh, blue light protection. So don't worry. <laughs> um, uh, so if you're having a lot of blue light in your environment, um, then that system is gonna um, get disrupted and you need way more DHA. Uh, and there's a lot of DHA in seafood. so then it would be wise to eat more seafood. But in the summer, for example, if you're outside all the time, like me, I go outside at seven o'clock in the morning and I go inside when the sun set. So, and if I'm outside and the sun is already set, I got blue blockers on, my skin is protected. So uh, my DHA system is working, I would not say optimal, but close to optimal. So I don't need as much... Uh, seafood or DHA in the summer as I need in the winter in general but um, so in context I would recommend eating fish twice three maybe four times a week if you're healthy if you're not overweight if you don't have skin issues or gut issues or you have a certain type of disease then that would be fine in the winter and in the summer two times is fine but are you healthy I don't know. People think they are healthy because they got a six pack and they look good and they uh, they work out seven, eight times a week. But how's your hormonal panel? How's your sleep? Mm. How do you really feel? Um, so it's really hard to say this is how much seafood you need. Mm -hmm. Can seafood be harmful if you eat it, uh, let's say, uh, three times a day, every day? Uh, I don't have the numbers on that, but I can imagine that everything uh, you you do excessively and, and, and focus on all the freaking time, I think yeah, that can harm the body. Does it harm the body? Depends on the context. Again, for me personally, I eat fish four times a week. Um, yeah. And you seem healthy. Uh, yeah, my lab works. My 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 lab uh, my labs always say that I am healthy. I feel healthy. Yeah. Um, I sleep good. I have a lot of energy. Uh, I exercise. Uh, my thinking is pretty okay. <laughs> Seems like so, it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I feel really healthy. Yeah. Good. Good. Um. So I've, we've got quite a few questions, obviously, from the the live that we're meant to be doing. So just before yeah. we jump to that, let's quickly touch on magnetism. Uh, you know, there's natural magnetism, and I'm sure we're going to speak about grounding uh, and yeah. why that's beneficial. And then obviously you can discuss some of the modern magnetism issues that we have uh, with modern technology. Yeah, so the mitochondria is an environmental sensor. And basically everything um, is an electromagnetic signal that, that goes for uh, sound, that goes for a light. Um, so the mitochondria is focused on feeling those signals temperature could be one as well that's also a signal and uh, react accordingly so let's say for example it's pretty cold in the winter um, you know that because there's not a much uv light the temperature is different and the mitochondria needs to produce its own heat to protect the body against the cold now those days we we're putting the airco or uh, the heater on but back in the days the body has to change something and to, to build a bigger fire inside to protect itself against the cold. So the electromagnetic signals um, are really important because it uh, it tells the mitochondria what to do. Has to be um, do we have to deplete cal calcium or it has to be um, do we need magnesium or um, what do we have to do? It's a, it's a constant signal that tells the body. Where am I on earth? What's the situation in my environment? How can I um, react properly to that environment? So that environment was always natural, natural sunlight and natural electromagnetic field, but also the earth's electromagnetic field was natural and was okay. It was between zero and 40 Hertz around about. And now we have power plants that produces energy for us and for our equipment and um yeah in the states that's around 60 hertz and in europe it's around 50 hertz so that's a not natural signal and we are an electromagnetic antenna 
your hair is, your skin is, your eyes are, to absorb that signal and react accordingly. So if, if I give you a fake signal all the time, then your normal signal and your normal system is not going to work out. So for example, um, you're driving a car and that car has certain type of fuel, but also a certain type of manual. You uh, An automatic car, you use it differently than one with a stick and a gear. So the signal I give to that car is not matching the software of the car. So maybe a computer is a better example. If I have a, an Apple computer and I'm gonna run Microsoft software signals on that computer all the time, it's not gonna work optimally. And if I do that chronically, year after year after year, fake light, dirty water, fake foods, out of season foods, electromagnetic fields that are not natural from Wi-Fi, computers, tablets, or all kinds of stuff like that. The hardware is not functioning properly because the input from the software, the environment, is not natural. Mm. And then we're gonna get problems. You're gonna produce less energy and the less energy is gonna result eventually in a disease. Mm. And what kind of disease depends on the signals you get, your, uh, your history, uh, your haplotype, stuff like that. Yeah, something I just want to add in, you know, it seems like it's this really complicated thing. And, and it is when you delve into the science, but, you know, people get really worried. Okay, can I, I saw someone post the other day, they said, I can never eat an avocado again, because I live in Canada, and they don't grow here naturally. And, you know, there is all these things you think, okay, there's specific types of food, you should be eating in according to your light environment, and your grounding and your Wi Fi and that. And it seems like a lot of things. But when you actually put them into place, as you and I can say, it, it can have such a huge impact on your life. And I think, you know, it's, it's not about watching this video and changing everything in one go. It's about proving it to yourself. Like I found the first thing I did, I got blue blocker glasses and I blocked out artificial light at night and I found that my sleep was better. And through that, I trained my brain. I'm like, okay, so I make a small change like this and this is the impact it has. And through that, you know, you build habits, you change your lifestyle accordingly. Um, and, you know, this isn't a, a one, uh, you don't just change everything in one go. It's, it's a journey. And I mean, as you it's, a, the it's a journey, it's a change of mindset. And you also have to figure out what works for you and what you're willing to do to become optimal or healthy. Only uh, the thing I learned from Jack Cruz is that people think linearly. So when I do something, I get this result. But with the sun and with nature and we see it all around us, if you, if you learn how to look, things are not linearly. So yeah, on one hand, I'm always happy that I know Paul Czech and he's also into the mind stuff of it. And if, if something that you're loving uh, to do is uh, making you less stressful and if bio hacks or changing your lifestyle is going to give you a lot of stress, then you have to rethink if that's, it, yeah, if that's, if that's uh, good for you, yes or no. But on the other hand, if you don't know the implications, then you're going to say, ah, just calling once a week with my phone against my head is no problem. Or that avocado once a week is no problem. It, it can be no problem. It, it also depends on your context again. So, but um, having friends and having uh, being able to live and make fun and don't take it all too seriously is also part of being healthy. So uh, yeah, I can imagine that that it's pretty hard just mm. test it test it test it that's all mm. i can say actually cool so let's get into the question we've got a couple of really good ones i'm going to start yeah, of course. With the comments in there um this is quite a big one this is from desiree she's in australia and she says we know that the skin plays a major part in the production of melatonin and the whole circadian rhythm and if exposed to too much artificial light as uh, produces well, to too much artificial light the process can be disrupted and causes an imbalance when wearing blue blockers though, what is the extent of the effect or how much does that artificial exposure to the skin contribute to the imbalances on a whole um, in relation to blocking the blue light through your eyes? So she's asking that, you know, skin versus the eyes. And she says, how does this uh, influence extent? So the second part of this question, how does this influence slash extent the imbalance change with uh, exposure in the day 
versus exposure in the night. So basically, yeah, she's asking what's the difference between skin and through your eyes, artificial light, like which one's more important? And then okay. would this be a different factor in the day versus at the night? Okay. Um, yeah, I would, I would ask her a question back, and that is, what is the biggest organ we have? And then I hope she would answer the skin. So, um, yeah, uh, blocking the light from the skin is also really important, especially uh, around the thyroid area as well, especially because she's a woman and her thyroid is made way more sensitive to the environment and light is something in the environment because she needs to make sure that the environment is safe to produce offspring. So um, uh, that's where, why in general, um, uh, uh, men sleep way better than women because uh, they are able to uncouple uh, uh, their mitochondria to go into sleep because they're a little bit less sensitive to the bad signals but also to the good signals in the environment and that's why their health is more protect, uh, protected and her, uh, their circadian rhythm is more constant and in women it's more fluctuating because they have to be extremely sensitive to the environment and make sure can i make offspring am i allowed to make offspring how's the environment here how is it with the food and the light and everything so protecting your skin is a really big one it's a really big one for everybody but it's a really really big one for women so um what's more important mm, yeah I'm not able to answer that question. Just make sure you wear your blue blocker and make sure you cover your skin as much as you can. It's like almost asking which leg is more important with walking <laughs> left or right. I mean, yeah, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> would you would you say that it, there'd be a difference um, between whether it's during the day? So let's say uh, Desiree is sitting uh, during daytime and she's got her blue blockers on in front of a computer. Does she need to be covering up her skin as, as much then? Is it an issue versus at night, uh, if she's wearing, you know, maybe a different pair, maybe she's got an orange or red pair of night blockers on at night, but then her skin is again susceptible. Would the skin be more, more of a factor at night? Would you need to worry more maybe about melatonin or something at different time of the day? Uh, yeah, you would because the, the, the frequency that is coming from the computer is weirder or more off during the night than during the day. Mm so i would protect it as much as i can in both situations but at the night yeah it plays a bigger role because that's the that's the the window where the melatonin um uh has to become active mm -hmm. and if there's blue light you're gonna make it less active or you're gonna inhibit the activation of the melatonin okay Perfect. So the second question, uh, this comes from Savi uh, Baskio. He was actually at the Human Foundations course where you gave your talk, Benjamin. Yeah. Um, and he says... Machine that guy. <laughs> hey? a machine. He looks like a machine that yes. guy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, as our body is made to get light between a frequency of, of 250 to 780, as far as I know, we shall be outside to get this kind of light in the morning, midday and evening. But... As we do that, how is the DHA fat connected to the whole thing? Is there a way to figure out how much DHA we must get, depending on how much artificial blue light we get uh, next to the natural sun and magnetism? Can you help me a little bit there? Because so I, I think what, 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 he's, what he's saying is, um, based on the lighting environment around you, how, would that, um, how could you determine how much DHA you need based on your light environment? Uh, yeah, that's almost the same question as the question before. Mm. The more blue light you get, the more DHA you need. And we're not built to only have uh, 250 until 780, he was saying. Yeah, that's visible. That's, uh, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, a little bit of UV as well. But um, um, yeah, we're built to have also the infrared part of the spectrum and the infrared a, B, and C can go up to 100 million nanometers. Okay. So the fact that you don't see it doesn't mean it has a function in us. And that's also pretty hard with electromagnetic fields. The fact that you don't smell it, see it, taste it, can touch it, doesn't mean it has an influence on, on us. And that's what I meant before, what Jack Cruz was really teaching me. Like, that's a linear way of thinking. 
and the effects of light or electromagnetic fields are non-linear because they, they have so much implications but the fact that we don't see it or we don't uh, uh, recognize it doesn't mean that there is an effect so for him the more you're in blue light the more dha you need because dha melatonin and vitamin a are loose covalent bonds so it means that the frequency the vibration mm. of the non -nat uh, not natural light is going to break up that bond and then it's going to be a free radical Okay, he's got a second question. He does, he does apologize for his English, he says here. Uh, we want to get in the morning and the evening light on our skin in the first 15 minutes as the sun comes up or the last 15 minutes as the sun goes down. However, when somebody lives in a valley and the sun has to travel first to the highest point, I get this as well in my house, of the hill mm -hmm. is reached to get in contact with our skin. So does it still have the same effect as the sun rising on the ocean's horizon? Um, I think he's just going to go into more. If it hasn't the same as the sun, is it better to be half naked outside knowing the skin, skin is reflecting sunlight to our skin during the first 15 minutes of sunrise? On hill or shall we? Yeah, so basically his question is, you know, if you've got a hill next to your house uh, or wherever you live, and I know I have this as well when I'm, I'm close to the mountain, I only see sunrise a bit later. So is yeah. it still the same benefits or what, are the cha what, what kind of difference is it then? So from the moment the sun comes up, in a window of two hours later it's okay and of course when you get the sun directly on your skin the effect is bigger but on the other hand i always say if the eyes are able to see it means that there's enough light to give a signal to the body mm. and the same goes for the skin i read an article uh, or i heard it in a podcast not sure anymore but that one photon can change your uh, circadian rhythm that's just one photon sure yeah. so you, yeah you basically answered his second question because well the second part is he's, he's saying should you be half naked outside uh, just knowing that the sky is reflecting the sunlight so let's you know obviously people are going to think he's crazy anyway but would a mitochondriac such as yourself would you think he's crazy if he was half naked while the sun was still behind the hill but he had that that light coming through your answer. not at all because being outside is being outside okay and the more naked you are so uh maybe no clothes on but also it goes for glasses or contact lenses or something like that mm -hmm. the more we can absorb cool and if he has a lot of dha in the system he would be better to absorb that light that's coming in as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. awesome um question here from wendy harris i believe she's in south africa where i am too and she says can you tell me about the flicker rate I've listened to Michael Hamblin and he said that it's not a problem. Okay. Um, so <laughs> this is, for uh, you. I'm not answering this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the sun doesn't have a flicker rate. Um, it, it has to do with uh, the power grid we are using. So we are basically our bones and we are evolved around the DC electric current. And we're now uh, using an AC electric current all the time. And the input of that power into a phone, a light, or any type of machine uh, causes the electric field to change. And the signal, for example, into a lamp uh, is going to create um, a signal to the brain as well. So there we go with linear, not linear, or seeing or not seeing. The fact that you're not seeing the flicker doesn't mean that the brain or the body um, is recognizing that flicker and, and pickering picking that up i always explain it pretty pretty uh easy let's say i put my hand before your face and we're talking yeah it's not that convenient but okay i can talk now i'm gonna put that hand in your face 100 times in one second and then you have to still be talking to me what do you think where the attention is going to be from the brain on the talking on the conversation or on that hand that is in the screen or in in my attention zone all the time that's what the flicker rate does it 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 wears out the brain because it has to focus on something that's there constantly and it's flickering all the time um so not important i don't know what's your context of important yes or no i also uh, hear a lot of people that drinking good quality water is yeah all water is good because it's water um Mm. yeah light is light it doesn't matter uh, food is food don't eat too much uh, garbage but if it, if it's food in the supermarket it's okay you're good uh, mm. alcohol twice a week you're good 
yeah mm. it depends so flicker is it something you have to worry about in my opinion yes is is, is it your main focus and is is it going to fix all your problems no so that's that's such a, your last point there is so interesting because it's it's very interesting obviously you know i sell red light panels and it's amazing the amount of um uh, importance people give flicker rates to their you know their red light devices but you know there's so many they got lights around them all the time it seems like flicker does become a bit of a buzzword in the red light industry and i think it's it's because of advantage you know some some companies want to have that and i think that's that's what the first one came out that was flicker free and then every other red light therapy device was bad but you know as you say it's, it's a it's not the whole picture of it and um you know, it's, it's, I think it's still an early question that needs to be answered because, you know, as you say, there's, the sun isn't natural. I know Dr. Hamlin argues that some of their studies, they found better results with Flickr. And I think, uh, you know, there's, there's both sides to, they said that the cells absorb uh, photons better because it has a break in between. They say it's antioxidant uh, capacity can keep up. Um, but it's, it's, I think it's a very interesting question that's not going to be solved or completely answered um, this year at least yeah. yeah 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 more research is always good um i always try to connect it back to nature mm. how does nature work in that situation and the fact that it um is in our that it is in our advantage something some things are for example technology yeah you and i can skype right now but what what does it do for health or mm. how did nature uh meant to do this so um yeah i think flicker is important more in uh yeah more research is always good so uh, yeah mm. we have to wait and see but when it comes to my opinion i would always go for a machine without a flicker rate yeah but if you are in artificial light 24 7 or or 10 hours at work and you're gonna uh, gonna make a big fuss out of it when when it comes to a red light panel then i get yeah. the point but yeah, yeah. i agree Okay, so the next question comes from Mika Shru. She was at also at Human Foundation ZR. You've got some fans that are following you here. How do you use the red light panel best to get the most benefits out of it? Are there things that boost the use? And are these things that make that, wait, sorry, boost the use? And are there things that make that you don't get as much benefits of it as possible. Okay, so yeah, how do you get the most out of your red light panel? What would you what would you suggest um, to get the most out of a red light therapy device? Yeah, um, so if you did cold therapy, that, that could be a good one to, to use it during the cold therapy or after the cold therapy. And it also depends on your context, how healthy are you? Um, uh, I would use it sometimes uh, same when I use infrared sauna. So when you when you're in infrared sauna, you go outside, you're accumulating more UV light. So you can use it in in that context as well. Give yourself a boost of red light by being in front of the panel for like 30, 40 minutes, and then go outside on a sunny day uh, to accumulate more UV. So uh, you you can bring more UV light to your cells and uh, to all the body systems um yeah and red light is yeah always a good thing if you're missing it a lot in your environment red light can disrupt melatonin production and systems as well so don't use it uh we need dark also so don't use it like uh, at 11 12 one o'clock um just make sure you use it between uh, what is it eight and eight or eight and nine maybe depending on where you're living mm. so um yeah what do you think of pairing it with magnesium baths and in that with yeah, light, with light panel? Do you think it also goes well together? Yeah, yeah, perfectly. Yeah, yeah. There's a company in New York. I always forget the name. I will look it up later that they are doing that already. So they have a magnesium bed, uh, red light panels around it. And then, uh, yeah, just relax for 30 minutes. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Okay, we've got a question from Conrad um, Bogoslaw. Uh, I want to know the correlation between mitochondria and geographical location closer to the, in brackets, he says closer to the North Pole and food. So correlation between mitochondria and geographical location close to the... I, I, yeah, if I get the quest, question correct, he's asking about a certain type of haplotypes, uncoupling, coupling of the mitochondria. So let's say, for example, um, I'm from Northern Europe. 
um, uh, I have a white skin, so I have to uncouple my mitochondria in the winter time and can be more coupled during the summertime uh, to produce energy, to produce heat, to protect myself against the environment. And let's say uh, people in uh, Kenya or uh, Congo or something like that in Africa who live close to the equator, they have a darker skin, so more melanin in it, and they are more coupled. Mm -hmm. And the food that they eat there, are probably uh, more carbohydrates as well because they grow there and if you eat carbohydrates um, you're gonna stay more coupled mm -hmm. and if you're gonna go into ketosis you're gonna get better at uncoupling and using the electron chain transport more um, so yeah it depends on where you're from where you're living um, what your genetic code uh, what your mitochondrial hop haplotype it has an effect on how you should manage your environment so his second question um similar to the first he says but he wants to know the correlation between your circadian rhythm and your light cycle and what he means specifically is when you've got a short uh, a short or a long day as it changes across the seasoning um mm -hmm. and he wants to know in terms of your seasonal rhythm and exposure to cold environment Mm, so he, he does go on further so let me let me explain further he goes obviously someone living close to the equator will have a different circadian rhythm and will eat differently their mitochondria will work more efficient compared to someone living close to the north pole where winter is long and cold days and days are very short some periods only night could you guys explain what would be optimal to do in such a scenario uh I think I don't get the question, but uh, it's not necessarily true that somebody who's living on uh, in yes. Ecuador yes. Yes. has um, better mitochondria than an Eskimo, for example. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, and that, that doesn't have to be true. Uh, so cold Conrad, therapy, cold yeah. therapy is more wise when you are uh, living in an environment with short light cycles where the temperature is down, when the UV mm -hmm. light is less. So, but it doesn't mean that there are not certain type of context you can use cold therapy let's say if in example at ecuador you can use it there as well if you know what you're doing i was trying to see i know conrad did email me his question previously um so let me see if he's worded it any differently people that live near the equator let me come but for those near, but for those that live far away supplementing yeah i know you guys are using this way. Yeah, no, it seems the same question. Okay, so I think we have answered it based on the, the cold bin there as well. Um, okay, and I believe we're down to, this might be the last question. I've just got to check. I think there's two more questions. So the next one is from Stuart Lynn. And he says, being from Australia and the daytime light being pretty similar year round, is there a particular time of year you should use red light more? Any adverse effects using it too much in summer? Question mark. It's not natural light. Your red light panel so uh, i would always recommend to use the sun because the frequency uh, frequencies there are more balanced um it also depends where he's living in australia uh what kind of water is he drinking because australia is a pretty shitty continent when it comes to water um so um yeah i cannot answer that question entirely what would you say what i mean Let's say he was having good type, good quality water. Um, I mean, similarly around, you know, so let's say his lighting environment, they're in quite a tempered climate. Let's say his lighting environment isn't changing much. Do you think he needs to change how he uses red light therapy? Well, why would you uh, use red light therapy if you got so much sun? Then you yeah. can use the sun, right? That's, that, that's exactly what, I mean, we're, the first thing we always say is your first prize is not actually red light therapy. Red light therapy is not, you know, if I had to go to a caveman, and speak to a, or one of our ancestors, I wouldn't try and sell them a red light panel because they don't, don't need it. You know, it, it should be viewed as, as a supplement to your lighting environment. Your first choice is natural, natural yeah, lighting. It, it, it's just a tool in the toolbox. That's 100%. what it is. And six, 700 years ago, you don't need a toolbox because you get water what you get, you get food what you get, you get the light environment that's there. So. Uh, you cannot fuck up your system with blue light at night or with Wi-Fi and stuff like that. So your toolbox should be pretty big. But the fact that you buy all the tools doesn't mean you know how to use and when to use the tools. And you have to educate yourself in that 
in your context and then mm. you have to check your context all the time so you know do a search for electromagnetic fields every two months every month maybe every mm -hmm. month maybe um so yeah cool. i don't know i don't know enough about this context to give him a, a really mm -hmm. good answer so we've got two more questions i will um we'll stop it with that one because i believe this is in within the live time uh, we got from jared lau he's asked uh with the use of cbn that's cannabinol and cbx targeted for sleep uh through the body's natural cannab endocannabinoid system have a negative impact on your circadian rhythm so would cbn have a negative impact on your circadian rhythm uh, again context uh, it depends i don't know uh, it depends i don't know i don't know much about it what i do know is that the endocannabinoid system uh, has a big role uh, uh, in uh, in the connection with nitric oxide and nitric oxide is produced by uva light um so this the the vessels of the skin can uh, can go come up higher to the surface so you can uh, absorb more uh, uv light so um uh, it's it's a man-made produced thing normally and even though it's a plant, it doesn't mean we have to use that plant or that that plant is completely natural when we are using it. So I would tell him if he has sleeping problems, I would go for blue blocking glasses, being outside as much as he can, um, ground as much as he can, um, swim in open water maybe, do some cold therapy, use stuff without interference of humans so if i jump into the ocean of course there's going to be some plastic in it there is already interference of humans but there's less interference if i go to africa and lay in the sun there yes of course the electromagnetic fields and maybe uh, they want to control the sun and everything but for now there's less interference of humans and if you buy a product you don't know how that product is made uh, where it's where it's coming from what it's made of yeah of course there's something written down on the bottle but it doesn't exactly describe how that process is working so mm. i wouldn't use it okay cool sorry I, I missed one question so i do have uh two more questions um, no problem i got the time so don't worry <laughs> yeah yeah the first one's from kirsten uh, flanagan she's a biohacker in cape town south africa and uh, okay. she says uh, we've, we've covered this basically but she said what can we do to mitigate the effects of deuterium on our mitochondria? Accessing deuterium depleted water is quite difficult. Is it a major concern of yours? I think you've answered it, but let's, let's, I mean, if you want to add anything to that. No, if you're not sick, then it's not a major concern. Okay, cool. Um, and then last one is from Saskia. Should men and women use the lamp in different ways, like other times or longer, shorter durations? I believe she's talking about a red light uh, panel. Okay. okay. Men versus okay. women. Yeah. So I try to explain that men are uh, men and women are a little bit different, um, as you all know. I hope. Um, so yeah, I would uh, tell her that uh, she needs a little bit more use of it than her husband or a man does, but um on the other hand we're missing so much red light now these days that uh yeah if you're an indoor environment and you're not able to open up the window or getting natural sunlight then use the panel so woman oh uh, yeah women need it a little bit more than men but now these days with the context of men i think it's almost leveled out because everybody's living indoors most of the time mm. Perfect. Okay. So you're going to have the decision now of picking one of those questions. I don't know if you've got something in your mind. I'll, I've written them down. So I'll give you a quick refresh if you need it, unless you're quite sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Give me just a, okay, a little okay. uh, quick. Uh, okay. I don't want to do any, anybody short. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, what we're going to be doing is we have asked the best question out of those is going to be winning a MyLight panel. Um, mm -hmm. There is a second option for the person who wins. And this is just, uh, it's going to relate to the announcement as well. So mitochondria is also, we're releasing a 600 watt uh, full body panel and that's going to be coming out on the 28th of this month. So in the next week or so. And nice. um, for the person who wins, if you do want to upgrade yourself to a bigger panel, then you can also speak to me and well, I'll send you a message and we can find out whether you would like to be one of the first people to receive one of those big panels. 
And uh, yeah, from the 28th of October, we're going to be opening sales and we're going to have a launch sale. So you're going to be able to pick yourself up a, a full body panel for a ridiculously low price um, in, the, in those five days. So um, Thomas, the first question came from Desiree and that was the difference between skin and eyes and the effect right, yeah. different times a day. Uh, the second one was from uh, Savi Fascio, and that was talking about the light. Um, you know, if you've got a mountain in front of your house. Yeah. Um, Wendy asked about flicker rate. Uh, Miko asked about red light therapy, um, how to get the most out of a red light therapy device. Uh, Conrad asked for the correlation between mitochondria and location. Um, and he followed that on with the DHA question. Uh, Stuart asked about red light at different times of the year. Um, based because he's in Australia. And then we had Jared asking about the endocannabinoid system. And yeah. Saskia asked about men versus women. And then Kirsten Flanagan asked about deuterium depleted water and um, how you could, mit if, if it's a major concern. And yeah, I would go with Conrad if I can add just a little bit. Okay. Um, because uh, uh, that question is a good question, but I don't think he knows why it's such a good question um your environment and your haplotype um are pretty important to uh the lifestyle you have and it becomes way more important um a role where you where you're gonna live is gonna be important as well uh, 5g is coming up electromagnetic fields crowded cities the, the more crowded the city is the more electromagnetic fields are so that's something jack cruz always teaches all his students or his members or how do you want to call them is that population density sorry the black swans oh the black swans yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, i'm not there yet i i think <laughs> but uh, maybe one day but uh the population density is going to be really important as well because we talked about the mitochondria and that it's picking electromagnetic signals from nature but also uh, a human made a man-made um so the more you are in an area that there are electromagnetic fields the more you affect your mitochondria uh, in a negative way. So, um, yeah, uh, that, that's a tip Jack Cruz gives everybody, and I completely agree with it. Try to live in an area where it's not so crowded or it's not so populated because mm. of the electromagnetic fields. 5G is coming up in most countries, and it's going to be worse. So your haplotype, yeah. Yeah, but more where you're living is really important. Yeah, that that is actually the gist of what uh, Conrad was saying because I know he emailed me previously, and when I read this question, I was like, "Wow, this is a a really big content contender." Um, and I think his English was just a bit lost in there, but you know, as we discussed it, it seems you know he's talking about those two. So well done, Conrad. You're going to be getting a MyLight uh, panel, or I'll speak to you if you want to be getting one of the full body uh, panels that are coming out at the end of this month. And then um, I wanted to say a huge thank you to you for joining us today, Thomas. It's been really insightful and uh, very exciting with all the technical issues that we started with today. Yeah. Again, yeah. anyone? Yeah maybe, watched, yeah? yeah, maybe we can do it some, uh, sometime again and then the people is going to be live because I, I feel a little bit shitty as well uh, about I, this. I, yeah. The technical stuff is not my thing. I'm, uh, yeah, no, I'm not well, really good well, with well, phones and computers. So We'll do it again and we'll try a different platform somewhere where you and I can practice. Um, make sure that it works so we'll get a platform that hosts and we'll give we'll give away another light in the next in the next month or so or something we'll plan something and we'll we'll let you know right, but, well, yeah. that's really generous of you yeah that's <laughs> great. yeah um and then for those of you who uh do want to get hold of Thomas, I, I i speak a lot to Thomas personally i um ask him for a lot of um feedback on things that i'm doing with both my business and with my lifestyle uh, something i can even share with you personally quite recently is my partner holly she's getting an amalgam filling removed uh, from her teeth. Um, and one of the reasons you wouldn't want to keep amalgam in your uh, body is because it's mercury. Now there's a, there's a few different ways that you can get it removed and you can do it really cheaply where they just basically yank the amalgam filling out, but they don't really take any precautions for uh, getting mercury poisoning afterwards. And we found a really good um, practitioner here in Cape Town who's gonna to be going through the whole uh, proper process um, of using the different kind of ducts and stuff in your mouth so that you don't get mercury poisoning. Um, Holly did a whole bunch of blood work before and after. And still, I made sure that I contacted Thomas, and Thomas made a very good point um, that we had to discuss with the, the professional that we're working with in that you need to control your light environment because, as Thomas explained to me, 
you know, a blue light, if they're working under blue light, it's actually going to affect the way that the mercury electrons spin and it could lead to a higher risk of mercury poisoning. So we had the discussion with our professional, we spoke to Thomas about it, and basically we've actually made sure now that they're gonna be using our red light devices actually, they're gonna be using one of the MyLight minis, um, and they're gonna be using as much natural light as possible. So if you have anything like health related um, that, you, that you want answered, then I highly recommend you get hold of Thomas. Um, Thomas, uh, would you mind leaving your details with me? I'll make a post in the group. And then if anyone could get hold of you, I think that would be, yeah, I highly, highly recommend that they, they contact you for any of that stuff. And then yeah, last, thanks. Yeah. Lastly, um, I just want to yeah. say, you've got, you got a book coming out now, huh? Yeah, yeah, we got uh, me and my partner in crime, who, who I have to give the credit, Mirlon, um, uh, for, uh, for the tip for you and Holly. Uh, she's, she's an organic dentist, so uh, she knows uh, a lot about uh, dentistry and uh, of course she knows a lot about light as well uh, she's one of the co-founders of your health concept and together uh, we get a lot of questions from uh, clients like okay if i want to change my uh, uh, my diet because people are still pretty focused on diet we were like okay it's not important it's not important but we get that question so much that like okay let just let make a cookbook that's a mitochondrial cookbook and that's focused in on the food we think uh, we can eat. So there's a lot about a certain types of water and the deuterium content, seasonal eating, uh, fasting. Um, and there, in between every page, there's something about light, why light is important, why sunlight is way more important than food and anything. So yeah, we're building a, a black swan uh, cookbook. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, for now, um, it's in production. It's going to be an ebook. Uh, first, we're going to produce it in uh, Dutch, and after that, it's going to be translated in English. So, um, yeah, if it's coming out, I will give you a heads up so you maybe you can share it in the Circadian Warrior group. Definitely. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of English information out there. So we are for now we are really focusing in on on yeah on the Netherlands. So our website is in Dutch as well, but you can always send me an email to info at yourhealthconcept.nl. And yeah, I do a lot of Skype sessions with yeah with a lot of people around the world to try them to help them uh, with their health. So yeah, it's not an it's not a real uh, real big issue. You we can always do it to uh, Skype. So uh, if if somebody's on this call, just uh, make sure you put in Circadian Warrior 15. Uh, in your email, and then I will get you a discount code on your on your first consult at fifteen percent. I'm gonna use that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, sorry, I'll be using that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool. No problem. And uh, yeah, we we're gonna figure something out for the people who need help or questions. Uh, my English is not that good always, but we can we can manage it. So uh, well, any of the any of the South Africans. I mean, if your book uh, your the Dutch version comes out, I could even use it because I mean Afrikaans. We speak Afrikaans here, and it's very similar yeah, like we could we could get through it so um yeah if you need help translating perfect. i might even be able to do that with you <laughs> yeah perfect yeah but yeah, again Thomas, nice. Thomas, thank you so much for for the talk today um it's no been problem. really insightful again i've learned a whole bunch of new things today and i'm sure it's going to provide a lot of value to everyone we'll definitely do this again soon perfect we'll do thanks cool. thank you so much Thomas. Bye -bye. Cheers. Bye.